There's no separate. Now it's gone. It's flashing. Yeah. All right. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 22. The end of the book. Yes. Revelation chapter 22, verse 1. And then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. And he said to me, These words are faithful and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show to his bondservant the things which must soon take place. And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. Go ahead and be seated. The book of Revelation tells us about some terrible things that are going to happen uh, before the Lord comes back. In fact, throughout the New Testament, we see Jesus talking about trials and tribulations. And we're not exempt from trials and tribulations, although we'd like to. I think uh, those of us here have lived in the golden age of America, and we don't want to lose it. But, you know, all good things come to an end sooner or later. There's an article going around, some of you have read it, and you know, it's, it's being passed around. It comes from the uh, Nye County Republican Party. Uh, I, I noticed that the, uh, the Facebook link has been taken down. You can't access it through Facebook anymore. They don't like it. But it basically says that, don't worry, Trump is going to win. He's got a trick up his sleeve, and he's going to win. I don't know if that's true or not, you know. Um, that'd be good if it happens. Um, but, you know, I kind of doubt it. Um, I, I think Trump's not going to go away. Uh, he, he says he's going to start a, a new uh, social media channel, and... Uh, Maybe that'll help. I don't know. Um, you know, we've had uh, a whole lot of uh, what is referred to as violence uh, over the weekend, one, or uh, you know, this last week, uh, in Washington. Uh, a bunch of supposed Trump supporters broke into the uh, Congress, uh, into the, the Capitol building, and stormed the Capitol. Now, I have a video that shows something very different. Mm -hmm. uh, you can access it several places, but uh, Pamela Geller's website is a good spot. Uh, it shows clearly, I mean, it's not ambiguous at all, the Capitol Police opening the doors, right. standing aside, and welcoming them in. I mean, the Capitol Police are... They're not frowning, they're not threatening. Some of them are actually smiling. They've been standing to the sides and you know, saying, come on in. Um, like I say, the video is unambiguous. Um, I see on a lot of the pastoral help websites so that I get stuff from all the time that uh, I should condemn the violence. Okay, I'll condemn the violence. We should, we should not be participating in violence, and I don't think anybody here has. 
Uh, and if I happened to be there, I would be one of the peaceful protesters. The uh, great many uh, peaceful protesters that were there that the media did not show. The media did not show the crowds that were estimated into, uh, you know, uh, over a million. Uh, they wouldn't show that, would not talk about that. I'll condemn the violence, those few people who participated in the violence. Now, who will condemn the uh, three months of daily rioting that's been going on in Portland and in Seattle? Uh, we don't hear about that. We did hear early on how the city council was out with the protesters and supporting them. The violent protesters. We uh, will anybody on the other side condemn the uh, a, a member of the uh, Colorado Democratic Party Executive and Central Committee who said, I'm going to do everything morally acceptable to win. Well, this guy's name is Christopher Jacks, by the way. I'm going to do everything morally acceptable to win. We will lie, we will cheat, we will steal, because it's morally acceptable in this political environment. He says again, I believe there is absolutely justified violence in all sorts of circumstances. Mr. Jack said in the hidden camera footage, I do think there needs to be a militant group, and I love Antifa for that reason. Is anybody going to apologize for that? I don't think so. So what's, what's really going on? Well, you know, as far as the conspiracies, which I have no doubt, you can call me a conspiracy theorist if you want, uh, but I would be very surprised if there was not conspiracies. Most conspiracy theories are at least partially true. They've borne out that they're, they have some truth in them. Not all of them, most of them, though, and not entirely true, but they're partially true. But what we see is a basic playing out of human desire. For some reason, well, it has to do with our sin, our propensity to rebel against God. You know, people don't like that word sin. So let's use a different word. Rebellion. We're rebels. We're, as C.S. Lewis said, we're rebels who must lay down their arms. That's what it means to come to Christ, is, remember the old of the song? I surrender all to you. You remember, we talked quite a bit about the, uh, the Tower of Babel and what we learned from the Tower of Babel. They said, come, let us build for ourselves a city. You know, the, city the city of Babel is, comes before the tower. And a tower whose top is unto the heavens, not, not will reach unto the heavens, that's rather fanciful, but it's not in the Hebrew. And let us make for ourselves a name, otherwise we'll be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. And inherent in that passage is we want to do this all separate from God. We don't want any part of God's program. We want to do it our way, on our own. We don't want God interfering with our plans. And we know the story that God comes and prevents that from happening. He confounds their speech. He separates them into nations, nations that are constantly at war with each other. Now, peace between nations sounds like a really nice thing, doesn't it? And yet God said, in order that they may not do everything they want to do, we're going to uh, establish this conflict between nations. Unfortunately, it's God's will. Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace on earth. I came to bring a sword. He says, I came to 
kindle a fire, and I wish it was already burning. But we can look in the scriptures and see what's really going on. Uh, a good place to look is in the book of Daniel. Uh, Daniel chapter 2, talking about Nebuchadnezzar's dream of his great image. And Daniel says to him, I'm giving you the short version here. Daniel says, You, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue. That statue, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, its breast and arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell its interpretation before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. We can discern from this verse that whoever uh, is president this week, next month, whenever, uh, is the one God has chosen for his purpose. Mm -hmm. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand, and has caused you to rule over them all. You are the head of gold. And after you there will arise another kingdom inferior to you, then another third kingdom of bronze, which will rule over all the earth. Then there will be a fourth kingdom, as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things. So, like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these in pieces. And in that you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it will be a divided kingdom. As much as people want to try to unite the world into one kingdom, it is always going to be filled with conflict within that kingdom. Daniel says, but it will have in it the toughness of iron, inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. He's describing a world kingdom, not just, you know, on the continent of Europe or the continent of Asia or Africa or America, a world kingdom. And we see that uh, further on, that the kingdom of Antichrist is a world kingdom. And it says that in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay... They will combine with one another in the seat of men, but they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. You know, forced multiculturalism, which I think is what is being referenced here, is never going to work. People consider themselves certain within certain groups. Um, People have loyalties to, you know, we are this, you know. We're not like those folks on the other side of the hill. Uh, they're outlanders, you know. We are this, you know. My, my heritage is the, the Scottish clans, you know, and they were really good on this. The Macmillans don't get along with the Macphersons over there, you know, and every now and then... We go steal their cattle, and they fight back, and sometimes, you know, we lose a few people, but, you know, this is just what we do. A uh, great many countries were like that. Uh, you know, 
the uh, American Indians. Uh, Africa uh, was like that. Uh, you know, feudal Europe was like that. You know, we look at the map of Europe and we see, you know, the lines drawn. There, here's Germany, here's France, and they've all, you know, been. But it was really little kingdoms, uh, and they they spoke different languages. At the time of the French Revolution, one of the big issues going on was most people living in France did not speak French. They they spoke spoke uh, Breton and Cornish and. Flemish and all these different languages all over the place. Uh, and they didn't like being forced into uh, this big thing called France. Um, and the French Revolution never really succeeded, and that was part of the reason why. Uh, they kept having to adjust their policies to deal with the fact that uh, the folks from Burgundy didn't like the folks down south, you know, and there was intertribal warfare, which is common to most uh, countries. It was just happening all the time. But the kingdom of Antichrist, we see, will try to force people into this world concept of cosmopolitanism. We are citizens of the world, uh, you know, and that's why some of our politicians talking to talk about erasing the borders. Uh, it's not going to work. It doesn't matter if you erase uh, the borders. Canadian people in Canada are going to still consider themselves Canadians. People in Mexico are still going to consider themselves Mexicans. Daniel says that in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. This is one of the great promises of the Bible. This is God's kingdom, which will come completely in opposition to the desires of man. Uh, and we see several times in the Bible that it just happens. You know, if you're familiar with the, the movie Time Bandits, at the end, the, uh, the dwarves, the, which are kind of the good guys, they bring in all the armies from all times. They bring in Greek hoplites. They bring in Roman archers. They bring in modern soldiers with tanks to combat the devil. And they all fail. But when God shows up, the devil is just defeated because God shows up. You know. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. The truth of the dream is that God rules over the affairs of men. There is no other option. God rules. And whatever transpires on the earth, God is still ruling. Psalm 2 says he sits in heaven and laughs at the machinations of human beings to defy him. Jesus said that the uh, he will establish his church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So, that is the biblical perspective of world politics. How it's going to happen from our point of view, those of us living here on the earth. But what is the perspective of the kingdom of God? And this is, this is how we need to look at things. What did Jesus say to his disciples? Well, in Matthew 10, he says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. Good advice. Be shrewd as serpents, but innocent of dove, as doves. 
I was uh, in a seminary class with a guy from Romania. And I asked him, what is it like living under communism? He grew up uh, in Romania under a communist system. He said, basically, we ignored it. <laughs> we had nothing. We tried to, to have as little to do with the bureaucracy as possible. We depended on each other within the church. That's, you know, how uh, to deal with an unrighteous government. That's why the Chinese don't like the church for that very reason. They live outside of the bounds of government. Beware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in their synagogues. Beware of them. Don't have anything to do with the bureaucracy, or as little as possible. I know a guy who was a Bible smuggler back in the days of the old Soviet Union. He lived in St. Petersburg. But uh, he traveled all over. Uh, he said, one of the things you can count on is graft. He said, you can't, if you're you know, a subversive living in the Soviet Union, you can't just go to a gas station because they track you. They, you have a ration card. You only get so many gallons of gas uh, a month or whatever the period is. Uh, and when you go use that ration card, they know where you use the ration card. But he says, if you, you can flag down a tanker, a tank truck on the highway, with some kind of a signal you give them, they'll stop and they'll fill you up right out of the tank truck for cash. Mm -hmm. So, and you don't use your ration card, so they don't know, they can't track your movements. And that's what a, a lot of government uh, dealing these days is all about. That's the whole point of you know, cryptocurrency or digital currency or whatever. They want to know where you buy your gas, how often you buy your gas. They want to track every uh, transaction you make. And you will be even be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. You know, Paul was brought before uh, Festus and Agrippa. And what did he do? He presented the gospel to them. That's, you know, you know a, a, a number of uh, people, even in high places, uh, government places, accepted Christ. It says, Jesus says, when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say, for it will be given you in that hour what you are to say, for it is not for you to speak, but it is the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all because of my name, but it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. But whenever they persecute you in one city, flee to the next, for truly I say to you, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. They persecuted Jesus, they will persecute you, because the world we have a message that the world doesn't want to hear. It is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher and the slave like his master. But if they have called the head of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign the members of his household? Therefore do not fear them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Uh, no one's going to be able to say on Judgment Day, you know, I really didn't know. I didn't know I wasn't. I thought I was doing the right thing. What I tell you in the darkness, speak in the light. And what you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim 
on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who was able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Do not fear those who can kill the body. I went to a funeral yesterday for a good friend. He was one of my Bible college and seminary professors. I think I took six classes from him. And he passed away about a week ago. I don't know why. He just he was out for a walk and he just shut off. And I'm really sad about that. I'm not ever going to see his smiling face again. Uh, I'm not going to hear his jovial voice. Uh, but you know what? I also feel envious for him. He's out of here. He's with the Lord. So um, we should maybe look upon our departure from this world uh, in that way, that we're escaping. Jesus says, Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your Father. Without God the Father knowing about it. He knows about everything. He says, But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. And yet, despite the value, he's done everything he possibly could, including going to the cross on our behalf. Um, and in doing that, he showed his love, his goodness, but he also showed the evil that is in the hearts of all human beings. And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It's clear from the teaching of Jesus that the kingdoms of the world will be in opposition to the kingdom of God. The kingdoms of the world are fine with religion. You go to church on Sunday uh, and, you know, but you're ours the rest of the time. You know, our Constitution says we have freedom of religion. You notice that most modern politicians when they talk about the subject, they use the term freedom of worship. See, religion is what you do with your entire life. That right? is a part of what you are. They don't talk about that, that you have freedom to do that. They talk about you have the freedom to go to church and worship on Sunday. But outside of that, forget about it. But all these kingdoms of the world are going to culminate according to the scripture, in a one-world government, uh, which is also known in modern terms as the New World Order. We hear that a number of times. Now, when we have this New World Order, it doesn't immediately become the kingdom of the Antichrist, but it is just steps away. There are certain characteristics of this new world order that, uh, or when the, when the kingdom of Antichrist comes along, that we'll be able to see. Uh, in Revelation 13.5 it says, There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. That's three and a half years, by the way. Uh, and he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. One of the characteristics of the Antichrist, boastful, blasphemous. Paul tells us about another characteristic of the Antichrist. He says, now we request, this is in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed, either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Past tense. 
I guess that was the teaching that was going around. The day of the Lord has already come. We're beyond that. You know, we have churches that basically teach that already. The church is the kingdom of God. That's a false teaching. Paul says, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy, falling away, comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. boastful, blasphemous guy is going to say, I am your God. There is no God but me. You know, we can look at people throughout history. There, uh, you know, Certain of the Roman emperors declared themselves to be gods. Um, that wasn't that unusual a thing. The idea of God in human form uh, guiding and directing humanity was not really an uncommon idea. Uh, back in the first century, second century. And a great many human rulers, uh, we see it in Egypt as well, declared themselves to be of divine nature, at least as uh, equal to their gods, which are not infinite, uh, did not have infinite power, etc. Back in the Old Testament, Zephaniah says, Near is the great day of the Lord. Near and coming very quickly. Listen, the day of the Lord. In it the warrior cries out bitterly. A day of wrath is that day. A day of trouble and distress. A day of destruction and desolation. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. A day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and the high corner towers. Now, the transition from the kingdom of Antichrist to the kingdom of Christ is going to be a traumatic uh, day. And many of us here might possibly see it. Now, that you know, I, I'm not going to take a position right now on the rapture, that we're going to be out of here. Uh, that's a definite possibility. But still, even the coming, the, the setup for the Lord's return is going to be a traumatic time for his followers and a difficult time. He goes on and says, I will bring, bring distress on men so that they will walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood will be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to deliver them on the day of the Lord's wrath. And all the earth will be devoured in the fire of his jealousy. For he will make a complete end, indeed a terrifying one, of all the inhabitants of the earth. Revelation says that during this time will be, we will see the, uh, this person of the Antichrist, but we should never forget that there's two of them. It's a duet. In Revelation 13, uh, verse 11, uh, when we see verse 1, we see the, the beast coming up out of the sea. And then, then in verse 11, we see another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. In some way, he's going to be Christ-like. He's going to be a false Christ. And he spoke as a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. And he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose fatal wound was healed. We really don't know what that fatal wound is yet. It'll all be revealed in time. And he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. 
And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given him to perform. In the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Worshiping this image of the first Antichrist, the first beast, is a requirement. That was one of the things that disciples died for in the early days of Christianity. They were told they had to at least worship the emperor. Just once a year, come in, throw some incense on the brazier, uh, and leave, and you'll be okay. And they refused. They would not worship. The cry was, Jesus Christ is Lord and none other. But it says, he causes, now this is the second beast, the one that appears as a lamb. He causes all, the small and the great, and the rich and the poor, and the free men and the slaves, to be given a mark on the right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. He will be able to buy or sell unless you have this mark. What the mark is, I don't know. It says, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. Now, we don't know if the mark of the beast and the number of the beast are the same thing or what the relationship actually is. But it says, for the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. Uh, there are a lot of theories about what that means. Um, I had a theology professor that was adamant about the fact that the mark, uh, the number of the beast, 666, referred to Nero. And he had a reason why. Uh, but he didn't say, well, this is one of the things we should think about. He said, this is it. This is how it is. Uh, and maybe it is, but book of Revelation was written after Nero died. Nobody really disputes that. So why are we referring back to Nero? Well, maybe because the Antichrist will be in some way like Nero. Nero was one of the great persecutors of the church. By the way, back in, you know, back to the book of Acts that we're studying through, what did Peter and Paul and John and James had to say about the political situation during that, their time. Nothing. Nothing at all. Mm -hmm. We just do what the Lord tells us to do. And that's it. Don't worry about the political situation. You know, we vote or we write letters or we do this and that and the other. Um, that's all we can do. We cannot control the political system in our country. It's going to go according to God's plan. And unfortunately, God's plan has been uncomfortable. I got a great line from Harry Potter the other day. You know, all these bad things are happening in and around, uh, uh, what's the school called? Hogwarts, yes. I've actually been there. Uh, it's actually, the school Hogwarts is actually in the center of Edinburgh. It's not out in the country. I've also been to the train where the train station goes and goes up through the highlands. And That's a real train you can take a ride on. We were in uh, Fort William where the train station is and we asked this lady in the museum, what do, what do you do? Why do people come here? And she said, people come to see the train. I said, what train? She said, the Harry Potter train. <laughs> um, so, it, it's, a, it's kind of a neat, you know, in that big stone uh, bridge that bridges across the valley. That's a, very picturesque. And then right across the, 
you know, on the shore of the loch, there's a big tower, and you climb to the top of the tower and look out over the loch. And it's, it's, it's worth the trip. What's the line? What? What's the line? We're waiting for the Harry Potter line. Oh, the great Harry Potter line. <laughs> yeah, I got sidetracked, didn't I? <laughs> On a trip. It was <laughs> a all, these, trip. all the things happening uh, uh, at the uh, school. Uh, what's what was the guy's name? The headmaster of the uh, Dumbledore. Dumbledore. Dumbledore the, telling Harry Potter. He said, uh, "We're all going to have the opportunity to do what is right rather than what is easy." <laughs> oh, I think that's a good line for us. We're all going to have the opportunity to do what is right instead of what is easy. But Jesus says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Very comforting words. It's going to be very tempting to join with the world. It's going to be easy. It's going to be comfortable. But we need to do what is right according to the scripture. Revelation 19.19 19 says, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast, and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. It's going to be pointless to oppose Christ when he comes. All the kingdoms and kings of men are going to fail when God decides to act. And we don't know when. It's one of the things he told us was just be ready. It's going to happen. When it happens, Luke says there will be signs in sun and moon and stars and on the earth dismay among nations in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. When we see the beginnings of these things, when we see persecution coming, lift up your head. Your redemption is drawing near. It may be uh, a removal from this world, either by rapture or by death. It says, straighten up, lift up your head. This is your redemption coming. 